uh, meat and they partied with uh, you know divided up the meat drank their wine they went to phoenician uh, um, uh, cities where there was a lot of uh, trade they got a lot of uh, they bought a lot of goodies you know uh, jewels perfumes uh, they then they went to cairo uh, the you know the odysseus and his men they went to cairo they learned a lot of things there so it was a, a fruitful journey uh, Uh, so now does this journey that odysseus have remind you of uh, something else it's like our own journey through life so that is the analogy that uh, constantine cavafy has brought in and made it into this poem where he tells you that this is what your life is like you, it's you know uh, he, and he takes these instances from the original poem homer's original poem and brings it into this poetry so let me recite this poetry to you how many minutes shibu am i just rambling on uh, as you set out for ithaca hope your road is a long one full of adventure full of discovery lestrigonians cyclopses angry poseidon don't be afraid of them you will never find things like that on your own as long as you keep your thoughts based as long as a rare, rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body let's trigonian cyclopses wild poseidon you won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul unless your soul sets them up in front of you hope your road is a long one may there be many summer mornings when with what pleasure what joy you enter harbors you are seeing for the first time May you stop at Phoenician trading stations to buy fine things: mother of pearl, coral, amber, ebony, sensual perfume of every kind, as many sensual perfumes as you can. And may you visit many Egyptian cities to learn and go on learning from their scholars. Keep Ithaca always in your mind. Arriving there is what you are destined for, but don't hurry the journey in the least. Better it last for years. and that you drop anchor on the island an old man wealthy with all that you've gained on the way not expecting ethica to make you rich ethica gave you a marvelous journey without her without her you wouldn't have seen she has nothing left to give you now and if you find her poor ethica did not deceive you why is it you will have become so full of experience you will have understood by then what these ethicals mean there is no dc good, good job emma lovely good beginning so, well done hi sumati hi so any any comments that's nice. uh, great beginning any thoughts Very nicely done, Hema. Thank you. Wonderful uh, pointer. Good beginning. Nice journey. Very nicely chosen. Nice journey. Reflective poem. Yes. And a great start to this program. More so in these times. Right. Yeah, and you. <laughs> and the point of beginning and the point of end are different. He doesn't want you to go back to where you were. He yeah. wants to go somewhere else as an old man, full of knowledge and full of uh, experiences, which are different. And yeah. Yeah. also because I, I uh, that what I asked at the beginning was uh, uh, I was aware of too much about uh, Odysseus. So no, no, you're mute. You're on, you're on mute. You're on mute. You're mute. You're mute. Yeah. Sorry, I muted myself. No, I was saying that uh, I re very recently heard about the story of Odysseus. We've all heard of Iliad. but i find uh, the story of odysseus uh, so much more interesting when i you know uh, read it uh, his his wife penelope for instance she's been waiting 10 years for him to return in my whole bunch of doctors sitting at in her house and telling her that your husband is now dead you marry one of us and what she does is she starts uh, weaving a shroud she says uh, uh, laertes which is odysseus father is now old and about to die let me be be a shroud and once the shroud is finished i will marry you so by night she by day she weaves the shroud and by night she unravels it so the shroud is never finished so that she can you know she can 
not my so a lot of interesting fables in that and in all of these guys appear in that the, the lestrigonians the cyclopses and it is described in beautiful poetic detail how odysseus overcomes all of those things the uh, particularly dawn uh, rosy fingered dawn is how he describes dawn and blood red uh, wine red seas um, and the way he describes poseidon when he's angry uh, is is really beautiful it's, it's, it's a good read very nice yeah. wow yeah one one other interesting thing about the whole thing is the point he makes about uh, the fact that even though you may have a destination arriving at it is not the objective of your journey the journey itself is the best thing and uh, in fact in uh, odyssey when odysseus reaches the island he actually finds that nobody recognizes him yeah nobody knows him he is looking so bedraggled and all that nobody yeah. realizes that he is the great warrior who's come back and you the only identification thing was that his dog came to him and recognized him as dragging his tail and was you know so the only welcome he got was from his dog yeah. so even when you reach your goal it's not necessary that you would have uh, sort of achieved something great it's the journey that counts so that's that's the beauty of this So okay so yeah public poem by carol ann duffy uh, which talks about you know the whole thing from penelope your poem. volume is a bit low can can uh, you just okay don't know if i can increase it further but yeah, yeah. so basically okay. it's about you know penelope it's written from penelope's point of view and it talks about how she you know what hema described as how she's unpicking the threads and talks about how the man comes home at the end of the day and it uses odysseus or ulysses as he's also known to you know take you through a pers- a woman's life waiting for the man to come home in those days and in fact it's part of an entire book called the world's wife where every poem is about the wife of one of the famous literary characters uh, recommended reading it's an excellent book and of course uh, james joyce's famous ulysses is based entirely on the odyssey uh, but from a modern perspective you using a poet called leopold bloom so uh, great great uh, opportunity hema you've given us i'm looking forward to reading this poem yeah great. okay great job hema all right so let's move on to the next uh, speaker prasad or uh, ravi wants to say something yeah yeah i think uh, what struck with me is the that line which says that you don't need to fear all those people your fellows and others coming in the fear is within your own yeah story. yeah yeah and uh, i could not help but relate it to current times mm. when uh, you know 7.3 billion people uh, most of us are living with a shadow ep- epidemic behind us the fear of the yeah. shadow epidemic right the epidemic is there it's serious but uh, the fear in our souls is what i think makes us really afraid of many things in life yeah yeah true all right okay great point okay all right prasad over to you uh, uh, when i said i will speak today i had uh, called the topic creative license uh, i want to stay away from political reasons for banning books based on religious like satanic verses got banned uh there are all kinds of bans due to uh, either a, a political leaning or a religious leaning i'm going to leave all that out of the discussion and sort of dig deep into something pretty close to what could affect literary uh, people or anybody concerned with the arts which is uh, the creative license and particularly in the advertising field from where i come i want to share one anecdote and ask you all to comment as to whether we breached uh what is sensitivity or whether we use creative license quite often copywriters and creative people in the advertising business they take the liberty of using a certain appeal and then they finally say oh we have creative license to do that if it's exaggeration if it's just to make a point strongly so i want to go back to an anecdote where as an agency as a young agency we did something and you might say uh were we being insensitive did we take creative license and it's an interesting subject and it is not on the point on which most advertising agencies are bashed which is exploiting women uh to their advantage in visuals or in ads this was on a completely different topic and i just want to quickly share that anecdote with you uh we were uh, a five six year old agency sort of 
taking our baby steps to establish ourselves late 1990s and about 40% of our revenues came from a client called Panwire, Punjab Wireless. Uh, to those of you who know, Punjab Wireless was one of the early uh, companies which serviced the Indian Army and the paramilitary force with telecom equipment. This was the days when paging and mobile was still not even late 90s. Mobile was just sort of happening. But Panwire was into pagers and later they got into uh, other equipment. And we did a campaign for them, for pagers, uh, in a market where Motorola was number one to number nine. And the, the whole world's pagers were dominated by Motorola. We got hold of some, uh, Samsung manufactured this and sold it to Panwire. And we realized that this was extremely small compared to the uh, Motorola pages. So we built an entire campaign based on small but powerful. That was the singular thought, small but powerful. And we used, amongst others, Sunil Gavaskar. So the format of the campaign was we had the picture of the individual. And on the right, we had the picture of the pager. And we said, small but powerful. And we had three, four people, Sunil Gavaskar, A, B, C, ending with Adolf Hitler. Now, we were really pointing to the smallness and the impact that that person had. Okay. So when we reviewed the campaign internally, uh, one of the, the advertising agencies typically divided into two. Uh, one is the creative people who think, uh, you know, they've done something which didn't exist a minute before they created it. And the suits, suits are people like us who sort of try and sell it to clients. And, you know, they think we're constantly putting one, one, making them work with one arm behind their backs. So one of the suits, uh, senior vice president or somebody or my partner, raised his eyebrows and said, ah, do you want to use Hitler? Uh, let's stay with Gavaskar and two, three others we have. And uh, immediately four of the creative guys pounced on us. Oh, you guys don't have the uh, gumption. You don't, in fact, they use a volatile word. They said, you don't have the B to back good work like this. Uh, what the hell? We are not doing anything. We're only using Hitler as a symbol. So anyway, we got outshouted, uh, saying that you guys are always are not willing to take the risk. So we got, we said, Chalo, we'll bow to your wishes. And I personally took the campaign to Chandigarh to present it to the managing director and the executive director, Mr. Gurpal Singh and Mr. Ved Prakash. Uh, Mr. Gurpal Singh raised an eyebrow, didn't object, but maybe I was sort of uh, doing my hard sell. Uh, so the meeting ended and he approved the campaign. And it was to run. The campaign ran uh, nationally in the dailies. And on the third day of the campaign, I was besieged with calls from Europe, from, of course, from India, but largely from Europe, from all kinds of newspapers and magazines, uh, including from the BBC, all wanting to a comment and sort of pointing to the fact that this campaign had got reviewed in the press in Europe, comparing it to three other campaigns which had run in the last 15 years, all of which used Hitler in a sort of uh, what they call it eulogized him. It sort of praised him, even though we were saying small but powerful. They, they interpreted it to say that we were actually paying tribute to Hitler's capabilities. And then this led to, uh, and, and the biggest fallout of this was that in one of the key businesses of Panwire, their collaborator was an Israeli company. So uh, that was a double whammy. I mean, it can be bad enough uh, if, if the client gets bad press like this, but at one level, he could have said the bad press is not here so much in India. It was limited. But we, the moment we realized that Telia uh, was their collaborator and an Israeli company, we didn't know what hit us and 40% of our revenues, one young agency, and then suddenly realizing that the whole thing had blown in our face, all this thing of creative license that these guys said, we took the creative license to pitch it like that. So my partner and I did a video recording explaining the whole circumstances to the collaborators. So we addressed the video to the managing team, leadership team of Telia and exonerated the local leadership saying we pushed it and they did not because we wanted to save the collaboration. We, we can't save our business, we thought, but we'll save the collaboration. And we recorded that videotape, went and met Mr. Gurpal Singh along with a resignation letter, resignation from the business. 
Uh, and I must say, Mr. Gurpal Singh uh, had, had very broad shoulders. He said, we took the decision jointly to run that campaign. This is what makes you guys as an agency reach for excellence, which means you're bold, you think out of the box. Mistakes like this will happen. Maybe we were all insensitive. Just tear up that resignation letter, go back and create the next best campaign for us. But it taught us a huge lesson in the agency that there are some sensitivities and this will apply not just to advertising writers, it could apply to a, an author of a book or a performer or somebody who is creating a painting, whether in the art field or not. So it's important to figure out what is this creative license that you have as a creator. Uh, and what do you breach? When do you breach? Is it uh, based on social norms? Is it based on what is, is the right thing to do in your country, in your community? What is right here is not right elsewhere. Like the whole business of banning books, the criteria are very different from country to country. In the US, they ban books only if it has child pornography. In many other countries, they ban books for very, very different reasons. So Penguin supports a banned book week in the US where all the banned books from all over the world are sort of exhibited for people to come and, and buy. So this whole issue of creative license for an artistic endeavor seems to be a little nebulous, but maybe it's a personal responsibility people have to take. Prasad, how did the Europeans come into picture? Uh, how did the company yeah, I mean, is this ad? This ad basically it got picked up by Advertising Age internationally, and they have uh, a North America edition, a Europe edition, an Asia edition. So once it got in one country, then there were three European countries. Germany was one of them, but not only them. I must say there were three, four other publications who called me, and through the night I was handling calls uh, only on this. Yeah, because they're very, very sensitive on Hitler, Absolutely. no? Absolutely. Because you're considered a neo-Nazi if you yeah, yeah. start uh, talking about Hitler. But we were not the only one. They used this to underline three, four cases before in the last five years, which had all done things like this. And there was a big debate saying that, why, why is this happening? Why, why aren't creators more sensitive? I mean, would you do a sculpture and put it up in the town square? Can I just, uh, 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 about this creative license in uh, literature, culture, yeah. art, whatever. I, uh, the problem is uh, people should not look at it as a black and a white thing. I draw an analogy about, say, pain. Pain is a whole spectrum. Yeah. So there is a small ache which you can put up with. And there is an extreme pain which you're not going to tolerate. And this is just not on. So same thing with... Uh, perceived insults or, you know, uh, 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 this kind of, uh, so if that is a small little, because, you know, uh, Mandira Bedi wearing a tricolor on her sari or something, some undergarment having a national flag or a picture of a goddess. See, all these things are the ones which we know in public domain has, uh, you know, we know that it has caused a lot of problems, but there are others which where you should be, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, for instance, uh, Satanic versus Getting Banned was a sad thing. So many other books getting banned, which we feel is like a bit of an overreaction. So that's the whole spectrum. I think that uh, ultimately it will be a combination of uh, uh, people's, uh, you know, um, the mindset, the culture in the series, in the country, the uh, uh, lawmakers, the government, all of those people together will be the ones who are uh, putting a, uh, you know, measure on the spectrum. But uh, obviously, <laughs> Hitler was, I think, way beyond the place. This question of a spectrum, but the important question is who decides? So yeah, and the, not, just, uh, not just a government authority, or is it the body of writers? So I am asking. And the problem is, how do you decide? Uh, yeah, what is responsible? Uh, yeah. Prashad, uh, what part of the ad uh, sort of led to the belief that you were eulogizing uh, Hitler? Small I, I'll I'll give you an equivalent example in half a minute. Hmm. We were building a port in Gopalpur some years back in Dhamra, and uh, the uh, environmental activists they felt that we were hurting the turtles, hmm. whereas we were taking extra precautions to save turtles. And the, there is a big fight between us and an NGO called Greenpeace. Okay. Greenpeace is an international 
Yeah. Sir, if I may, can we just stick to the literature and all that kind of uh, talk here, since that is the. No, no, no. He is, he is trying to. Trying to be tough. No, I think Hema is trying are, to. If you try to talk, the... talk about banning and all of that, because the discussion will just go off somewhere. Yeah. But... No, no. But I think he was trying to relate to what's happening in the environment where people are mistaking a, 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 a projection. That's what I think Muthraman is. Yeah, saying. I think we have to stick to books getting banned or creative content getting banned or you know. Anyway, I don't agree with that. But I'm not going to comment just now. No, but I think you should complete it, Muthraman. No, no, I'm not going to complete Come. it. So we can't okay. stick to we can't stick to books and that is not the only subject that we need to discuss. Yeah, I also think so. Yeah, I, I would think Wait, that. Hey, go ahead, go ahead. I was just making no, a uh, suggestion. No, I go, go ahead. You know, books lead you to the larger life, so I think yeah. it's possible to stray. Yeah, out. please, Eric? sir. Please, sir. Don't mind me. Go ahead. No, no, it's okay. I, I'm not going. I know to. because already seven thirty-four. So I was just thinking the, you know. Yeah, yeah. Let the next person come. Okay. So, so next, uh, who's on? We have Dr. We have Murli Mohan. Right. Uh, I hope I can share the screen. Uh, yeah, not very really sure if I can. So I basically thought I'd, uh, you know, come out with some books, uh, some poems I've written. This is actually the very first time I'm ever sharing poems. They've always been between me and my uh, my laptop or my book. So you know, if you Permit me, I will go to the books. I'm not sure. Am I? Is it visible? It was till now. Okay. We saw it briefly and then now it it's came. Uh, now it's blank. Is this visible now? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <clears throat> right. So, one of my friends wrote a poem. One of my colleagues, Dr. Ishan Kapoor, wrote a poem, and I thought. It inspired me to write this book, and I really wanted to start with the question first. Because, uh, it says sharing is paused. Is this? Yeah, this is the usual problem I have with with Zoom sharing on Zoom. Shall I just stick to this? Can you all see this? Yeah, you, you don't go to screen share. I mean, don't go to the slide view. This will be okay. We can see. Okay, so uh, so since the whole thing is about words, you know, books, everything starts with words. I thought I'd start with this, uh, and I call this murderous echoes. It says, if words could kill, many would be serial killers, axe murderers hacking their way through life, or sliding a stiletto smoothly into the heart. But each word is another slash in a suicide of a thousand cuts. And the steady scarlet drip from both resounds in the silence when the words cease. So I wanted to talk about how words move from, you know, hurting one person to hurting the person who gives the words themselves. But I think nobody has spoken about words better than the Beatles. I'll just go through the first verse of this uh, lovely song, Across the Universe. I wish I could sing because it's a great song to sing. Words are flowing out like endless rain into a paper cup. They slither wildly as they slip away across the universe. Pools of sorrow, waves of joy are drifting through my open mind, possessing and caressing me. And then goes on into a lovely chorus with Jay Guru Deva Aum. Uh, but I really wanted to come out with the first stanza. The others go from words into images and images into sound. So they really talk about the whole gamut of uh, the sensual experience and take you across uh, the universe very heavily um, influenced by the time they spent in India. The second poem that I wanted, this, this of course was the Bee Gees who take a more romantic view rather than this universal view and I'm not going to go into this except to say that you know the they sing about how it's only words and words are all I have to take your heart away. Very romantic song, later sung by Boys Own also. We can't get away from the COVID era. We are in COVID times. And one of the things I have a great problem with is that my team has kept me out of COVID completely, out of the COVID wards. Uh, they feel I am, they know I am old, 
and therefore at high risk. I've also had a cardiac problem, so they believe, you know, I'm a very high risk person. I have a 50% chance of not making it if I get an infection. So they've completely banned me and I'm sitting outside advising them, writing, writing the protocols for the hospital and so on. But it's still difficult for a doctor who's been actively acting throughout his life. So I wrote this poem. I'm on the outside looking in while the young act and fall. I'm reading, advising, pontificating, that is all. Virtually I empathize, vicariously palpitate. Others struggle for breath and earn their crowned fate. I'm just an armchair general, planning battles in an eye cloud, digitally following the eye hearse of a warrior in an eye shroud. I spy on a COVID ward while I stand at the gate. I console myself Milton-like. I too serve while I wait. And of course, the last two lines come from are inspired by... Hey, that was really nice, huh, Murli. Fantastic. Uh, very nice. Thank awesome. You. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, awesome. Wonderful. So this Continue. comes from uh, Milton. The last, you know, he talks about how... So Milton became blind towards the latter part of his life. Mm -hmm. And he says, when I consider how my light is spent, air half my days in this dark world and wide, and that one talent which is death to hide, Lodge within me useless. Sorry. Lodge within me useless, though my soul more bent to serve there with my maker and present my true account, lest he, returning chide, doth God exact day labor, light denied. I fondly ask. But patience to prevent that murmur soon replies, God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts. Who best bear his mild yoke? They serve him best. His state is kingly, thousands at his bidding speed and post or land and ocean without rest. They also serve who only stand and wait. So I'm consoling myself with this last line. They also serve who only stand and wait. Uh, I'll stop with another two poems, but this one is very dark, uh, inspired by another poem that Dr. Ishan wrote, where two of his lines reminded me of the patients we used to see in the UK who cut their wrists and, you know, in an attempt at appealing for uh, help, but also to sh tell themselves and tell the world that they're alive, the pain they say brings them alive. So, you know, we somehow came up with this discussion, including our psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Rekha. So I wrote this, what dark sludge trickles through my veins? Whose unfeeling limbs are these? Whose head staggers through the fog, dead to the world and the world dead? A knife sings, the blade across an alabaster wrist, a sweet agony. Then effulgent, the metallic odor of blood like smelling salts and the dark red petals on the marble floor. I'm alive. And this is something that, you know, people go through, the wrist cutters, and they're really a very tragic group because they come back repeatedly to your ER and you have to stitch them up and listen to their stories and you don't know when they're really going to die. And this is written by a wrist cutter herself. And you can see how much more powerful it is. Have you ever felt a forest fire in your wrists? Have you ever felt your blood in waves through your veins, boiling, melting your skin? Have you ever opened up your body and let the extra blood out, let it cool off and felt the waves subside? Have you ever watched yourself bleed to quiet the voices in your brain? I have mixed salt water from my eyes with the red metal from my legs and watched them mix in my bathtub. I've taken a kitchen knife to my shoulders in place of dinner and felt more than full. I've opened veins so I could close my eyes and maybe rest if only a few minutes. I've rubbed ice cubes over my wrists, trying to numb them the way the blades do. I never wanted to be a slave to this addiction. I've drawn lines on my legs in attempt to silence the voices, the voices that beg for silver to release red. I've run away from the demons, feet pound, pounding on asphalt, and some days I'm fast enough but not always. I've listened to music through earbuds at dangerous volumes to keep the blood from pouring out at dangerous volumes. I am still alive. Some days that is all I can ask for. Most days it is enough. And this is, I mean, this is really a cry from the heart. I'm going to stop because this is two dark poems. I'm going to stop with a poem which is a little more hopeful. I wrote this actually, I think, when I was in the pre-university. So it's been sitting a long time. And I think I was inspired at that time. I've grown out of it by uh, Ayn Rand and, you know, human beings rising and also by Jacob Ronowski's 
The Ascent of Man, after I read uh, Darwin's Descent of Man, or The Origin of Species. So it begins, all life began in the sea, all life shall end in the sea. The sea will form an organic stew, and man will rise again anew, a better man, a wiser man, who can do better than eight sapiens can. A species of individuals heroic, bearing setbacks with courage stoic. Till at last a mistake fatal, then back again to seas prenatal. A bountiful sea of cornucopia, of faltering footsteps to utopia. Stop there. Thank you all very much. As I said, first time I've been sharing these poems with anybody. Very good. Very wonderful. Very nice. Very nice. Yes. Very, good. Ah, very, very good. Nice. Thank you so much for sharing it with our group. Thank you. Yes. And the, the, those poems are horribly heartbreaking, the ones. Yeah, very wrist cutters particularly. Yeah, yeah I, I had a question to you. What what drives the wrist cutters to do that? Uh, one of the things they talk about is how they are in pain. Uh, and, you know, the lines are used about how everything they feel, you know, is they don't feel essentially. Uh, the world is dead to them and they are dead to the world. And this is a way of reminding themselves that they are alive and the world that they are alive. And also they, you know, the pain brings them to life and the fact that the blood is flowing out of their wrist brings them to life. It's really a very, very tragic condition. And, you know, you see these young people, very often young men and women, who have these multiple cuts across the wrists. And in fact, one of the uh, other poems that I shared earlier with Dr. Rekha, our psychiatrist, who has a lot of experience with these people, is how they cut themselves across the thigh so people yeah. can't look out their wrist cuts. And mm -hmm. this poem appeals for people to look into their eyes rather than look at their wrists. Basically a cry to psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. So a very, very, very tragic condition. I, it's, it's sad. A lot of but them actually really, got uh, at really places like where the... people can't see. Uh, yeah, uh, Murli, I really liked uh, the one that uh, you wrote about as to how you are watching by as uh, not COVID. participating with trying to uh, participate, in, uh, trying to cure the, I mean, uh, to evolve something for the COVID patients uh, because of your age and because of certain ailments. And it's been brought out very beautifully there. I think that's very nice. Yeah, I like I like that too. Yeah, that's very. That was very well written. Very, very, very uh, interesting how you managed to convey all your feelings and the angst of being having to be forced to sit out, you know. Yeah, that's in fact, uh, one of my friends in the UK was also saying the same thing. The most difficult thing for doctors who are not able to actively participate is just the feeling of being, you know, helpless and sitting out while everybody else is uh, yeah. sort of uh, doing things, maybe even a little bit for them. So, okay. yeah, nice that's you. a difficult thing. Thanks for sharing that. That was beautiful. Thank you. Very nice. So, I, th I think we'll move on uh, to Geeta then. Geeta, can you hear us? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, but I'm kind of oh, overwhelmed. Um, surrounded by all these literary savants. And, no, uh, no, no, no. Yeah. I am just uh, trying to learn from you. I'm a wannabe Hema, wannabe Murali. <laughs> Anyway, please go um, ahead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just going back to my time when I used to enjoy uh, watching BBC series, uh, a whole series. I'm I'm still a very not an anglophile, but I just love uh, to watch BBC serials, some adventures. Uh, uh, are you being served and all the rest? But one in particular is um, the science travel blogger, right? uh, James Burke. And he takes you through a journey of, he, go, he just go, zooms past 20 countries in, in seconds, right? So he, it's sort of like taking you from, uh, and the show is called Connection. So it sort of uh, uh, takes you from the sublime to the ridiculous and back to the sublime. And that's kind of shaped my thinking also. I feel, I learned a lot when I used to watch with the family in the US, we used to sit together and watch James Burke. There were so many other shows, but my dad insisted on choosing James Burke for various reasons. And I still apply that those same, what it, the, the way it, it, it has influenced me in various ways, right? From 
the way I run my projects, connecting the dots and looking at gaps. So uh, that, and it's, and I enjoy the tongue in cheek humor uh, that he brings in. Learned a lot about mindfulness. He talks about how um, he goes through inventions and uh, sees a connection between some really absurd things. For example, the butterfly effect. And uh, so that's all I have to say. It's, it's worth watching and uh, it's very enjoyable also. So is, is it that he's uh, describing connections between human behavior and uh, uh, like animals or things? What, what exactly? Oh, no, no, more so inventions. So, uh, inventions, goes, okay. Yes, but not in that very boring, dull, linear sequence, right? He goes through uh, the connection between, like it's like the butterfly effect, a little sneeze and then it causes a storm like COVID. Uh, he talks about how uh, awareness, mindfulness can lead to more connection, uh, more inventions. Okay, uh, okay. He sort of connects the dots. So, okay, so being aware of your surroundings will make you sort of receptive to creating new things. Is that what? Indeed, yes. Yeah? One just okay. has to right. be mindful and alert and look for those connections. Right, right. Yeah, sounds interesting. So, is it available in India? I have the whole series. I mean, you're, everyone's free to borrow it for the whole BBC oh, okay. series. Okay, okay. And is James right. Kirk his real name or uh, does he take it from Star Trek? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's his real name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's a good one. James okay. D. Kirk. <laughs> is it Kirk or Burke? Oh, Burke. B-U-R-K. Burke. Okay, oh, okay, Burke. okay. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Okay, thanks Geeta for sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> Will uh, Bini, you're next. Yeah. Off you go. So I, I had actually sent out uh, a topic called We the Multilinguals. And the reason I uh, picked that up, in fact, mine was a very short notice one. I'm standing in for Mr. Muthuraman because he was not planning to attend this. So I thought I'll narrate a couple of incidents which is related to uh, multilingualism that all of us have. I mean, most societies like ours, people grow up in some state, they pick up some language, they're actually from another state. Originally, they worked in some other states. So we know on an average three to four languages uh, quite well to speak, we understand. And we relate to those cultures and those languages. So these are two incidents which happened in my life. Now, one very early when I was in school. So I grew up in Odisha. I'm from Odisha. Uh, uh, my parents uh, went there in the 60s and I grew up in Odisha. So as a, as a kid, one day in the morning when I was getting ready to go to school, and my mom was getting ready to go for work at around 8, 8.30 in the morning. We had somebody at our door asking for arms. And this was a sadhu in a saffron color clothing with long beard, you know, very long beard and had a coconut shell in his hand. And he was saying Amma Bhiksha Dede in Hindi. And the mom shouted from inside and we had, we had this uh, small container with loose change and coins kept there, which, you know, whenever somebody came for arms, we would pick up from there uh, a couple of coins and give us arms. And mommy was shouting from inside, asking me to give arms. Uh, I was getting late for school. So I had not uh, brushed my shoes and the clothes were all over the place and getting ready. So she said once, she said twice. And then uh, when she heard, this man was asking for arms. When she said third time, I murmured something in Malayala. What I murmured was early morning, these guys come with, you know, this cherita. This is the coconut shell that he had in his hand. And, you know, I got to go to school. I, I was maybe seven uh, in sixth standard or so, 12 years old, 10, 11 years old. 
and my mom came from inside. She shouted at me for not having given their arms in the first time when she said, she picked up two coins from there, went to give arm to this sadhu. And suddenly the sadhu in Malayalam told my mom, you shouldn't scold the kids like that. They are kids after all. I couldn't go to school that day because the way I had said this, I had taken for granted that in Odisha, in, in the early 80s, you wouldn't expect a Malu to be asking for arms in your house. So this, this left a very deep impression, especially uh, as a child. And this happened in the reverse way for me once. I was traveling from this town to Bhubaneswar, which is the capital of Odisha. And we used to take the local trains. We were 19 kilometers away from Bhubaneswar, so it took us, and my mom was on railway, so we grew up in the place called Khurda Road, which is the railway divisional headquarters, which is 19 kilometers from Bhubaneswar. Lots of people went to Bhubaneswar to work. So this time I'm in my early 20s or mid 20s, and I was there at 6 a.m. in the morning to take a local train to Bhubaneswar like many people who go to work to Bhubaneswar were. But there was some problem on the railway tracks and there was a dharna and there was no local trains flying that day. There was a strike. The railways let only the long distance trains fly. And there was this train which was from Cochin or Trivandrum going to Hara, which was allowed to go. So that train came and stopped mm -hmm. at the station, which is where we were. Every train had to stop because it was the divisional headquarters. And lots of local guys got into reserved compartments to go to Bhubaneswar, which would take just 10, 12 minutes. That's it, 19 kilometers. I was one of them. Because the other trains, the local trains were not flying that day. So I went in, stood near one of the reserved bays, and there were people who were traveling from Kerala to Aura, who were just waking up in the morning, you know, from their reserved compartment berths. And there was this guy on the side berth telling another guy, extend your leg so that these Odias don't sit there. Okay, in Malayalam. And he says, uh, you see, look at this guy, so uncultured. The, don't they know that it's a reserved compartment? Look at the way he's standing there. Could he have not gone to taken another train or to the unreserved company. And I'm listening to all of this silently. He is going on in Malayalam. There are a few other words which I can't talk here. These two guys are talking off. I kept quiet because it's a matter of 10, 12 minutes. As soon as the train reached Bhubaneswar and I got down from the platform, I went to the side where this guy was in the side berth, went there. And in Malayalam, I told him, Thank you so much for allowing me to stand there. I could see the same thing which happened to me 15 years back on this guy's face. Exactly the same thing that happened to me. <laughs> and most of this happened and people from other countries, they don't understand this because they have just one language, one culture. We come from different states, learn different languages, go around the country, work in multiple places. I'm sure many of you would have had such incidents uh, I once heard two priests, two Catholic priests in Kerala, in, uh, in Alve railway station, where I was waiting to board a train to go to Odisha. They introduced themselves there at the station and they realized that they are both working in Odisha and hence they knew Odia very well. And they were talking to each other in Odia, criticizing the church and uh, the clergy and everybody from the Pope right to everywhere. And I'm standing there beside him and I speak much better Odia than I can speak in Malayalam. So I, I just had to go away from there, not to listen to what they were talking. <laughs> so I thought I'll share this uh, experiences, but uh, would love to hear from you guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, that was very interesting. I'm, I'm sure all of us have faced these kind of situations. And uh, 
like I was telling Bini earlier, especially in the hospital setting, it happens very often that we come across patients and then we are, we are struggling to make the other person understand what we are saying, you know. And what we end up saying might often be <laughs> quite the opposite or very amusing for the patient to hear, you know, and they'll burst out laughing. And then somebody will, you know, figure out what the hell this doctor is trying to say and then <laughs> translate it. Eventually, of course, that helps us learn the language. But uh, it's, it's very interesting how multi, especially places like Bangalore, which have so many languages uh, okay. merging together. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. I was, I was reading a report which said that Bangalore has become the most cosmopolitan city in the country. Uh, in the sense, if you take people who have, uh, if you consider mother tongues, and the number, the threshold they have taken is 50,000 people in the city. There are nine languages which have more than 50,000 people speaking that language as a mother tongue in Bangalore, which is incredible. Wow, yeah, that's, oh, that's no, you, you, you can see that around you. I mean, literally, in fact, on the Zoom group itself, you, <laughs> you have a good example of that. Anyway, yeah. five languages I can speak. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think more. read, write, and speak five languages. Oh, you should read not, and write. You, wow, you should not include. In, you should not include English and Hindi because oh, they God. are compulsory for us. Yeah. <laughs> the three extra: English, Hindi, Tamil, Malayalam, and Bengali. Malayalam uh, script also. Yeah, yeah. I can read, uh, write, and. Gema, ask him when he learnt it. Ah, uh, when? KG class. No, no. First standard in South India Education Society. <laughs> wow, five languages by the time you were in first standard. No, Amazing. No. no, no, no. Bengali and all much later. Only the oh. Malayalam was in first standard. Yeah, for me, for me, it's five instead of uh, uh, Bengali, Odia, and yes. then Telugu. But you know, so recently the, now with the school, uh, in yeah, the school, they're they saying that if it is late mm. in life, then you don't. I spent two full years in Ahmedabad at I am, and I didn't learn a word of Gujarati. In school now, they're saying no that the in uh, children should be taught in their uh, mother tongue. Mother tongue. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of uh, difference of opinion about that. But then that brought me to thinking about how yeah. my younger son actually is monolingual, and that's English. Yeah. And I felt very sad thinking about that. It's not like we have not tried, but I feel that uh, now coming down more and more in the next generation, they are losing the grip of all languages but for English. Thankfully, my older son, eventually later on in life, he did pick up Malayalam. So uh, it's very we saw sad. In Delhi, and whenever we used to talk to my children in Tamil, even if they understood, they'll respond in English. In That's English. how it starts. That's how it starts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, we, the we used to thing. speak. We used to speak in. We still speak in Odia at home. Among siblings, we speak in Odia. We speak much better Odia than we can do in Malayalam. There's another thought, Hema, that you would want to consider. I was reading this article which say two things, which ask two questions. Which language do you think in? Or pray in? Or dream in? Yeah. The second was and pray. pray. And pray. So I think your son, he genuinely dreams in English or thinks in English. And that is probably the fault is with me because I pray and dream and think in English. Yeah. You may have heard of this gentleman called Kamlesh Pandey who wrote some yeah. very famous uh, Bollywood films. Correct. Uh, very, very successful. He was chief of Z Television and then went on to write uh, movies. Now, he was my creative director in Rediffusion and I worked with Kamlesh for many, many years. And some of the finest campaigns and some of the uh, most brilliant campaigns in English for Calico, for Jensen Nicholson. But the truth with Kamlesh was he used to say that all these great campaigns happen because I think in Hindi. Hindi. Yeah. Think so in Hindi. 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 Think in Hindi. So he says this brilliant Calico campaign where everybody is going, you know, gaga over this great English and all. He says that the thought I all Christians believe, no? Like vernacular. Yeah. You know, it, it is also like that when like uh, they spent time in uh, Germany, you know, because they first said after the first six weeks of trying to Germanize me, the guy said the same thing. Lakshmi, unless you start thinking German, don't think English and translate it. You'll make a mess of uh, your translation. And always it's think uh, in the language that you want to speak. Very, very correct uh, point. But I just want to conclude by one thing. No, I, I, 
you know, Bini said you think and dream. The third is what you calculate in. So my <laughs> father, if he is doing anything, would do his calculations in Canada. So money, money knows no language. <laughs> Just calculate. That's because you have learned the tables. Yeah. You, yeah. Ah, you're saying yeah, yeah, right, yeah. yeah, like all the Tamrams will, the original Tamrams will all do their Even multiplication. Today I can multiply. Well. A famous very quick ad where a fisherman, mm -hmm. a well dressed gentleman is mm -hmm. watching and he counts mm -hmm. the number of times he puts the mm -hmm. very quick on the mm -hmm. <laughs> Correct, correct. He puts <laughs> the very, very call. Who can I say the two tables in to, Tamil? You got to listen to what Suresh and Rajita have to say. There are they. Well, it's been a it's been a fabulous uh, evening. I must say that I got to hear a bit about uh, about Odyssey and we got a uh, and Doctor uh, uh, Mohan. Uh, your your poetry is absolutely superlative, absolutely superlative. I think you captured it uh, so well. I mean, I, I I write my own poetry sometimes, but uh, you have kind of uh, you are miles and miles ahead. And no, of course, that shows who's the one of the next speakers at the next. Yeah, time. yeah. You should, you should be must, here next. I must say that in, in Prasad's anecdote, what what I really, what I really liked was uh, not so much the usage of Hitler, uh, but the quality of the leadership that the managing director of Punwar had. Right. So you don't find those kind of guys anymore. Most guys today would have first sacked the agency, sacked thrown them, out Prasad yeah. from the room, yeah. and they could just get lost. Your stupidity has cost me. Uh, my partnership, and I think I think that is a tribute to the leadership of Punwar, and uh, that's something that uh, that is probably for me the biggest takeaway from the anecdote that Prasad had to had to say. But but great to join you guys. I mean, uh, I know I'm an I'm an absentee owner, but uh, it's a it's a great way to connect with the with the community and look forward to being uh, part of your community going forward as well. And okay. nice seeing you, Geeta. I think it's the first time I'm I'm I'm, I'm seeing you on, um, you know, uh, physically or, or at least on the on the Zoom. And look forward to being in touch. Good to see you. Go for having thought of this idea. Hibib. Hooray. Oh, okay. Hooray. <laughs> That's. But it was great that all of you could join. I mean, it was so nice. And uh, I think it's uh, bringing out something uh, interesting out of all of us. And I'm sure the discussions over time will expand and uh, should uh, lead us to new areas, you know. Okay. I think, so, Shibu, you and uh, next time. Rema, hats off to you guys. I mean, really start thinking of new things. Absolutely. You know, I think it's uh, COVID or no COVID. I think it's just an ability for us to get together. And uh, no wonder ABBA is becoming such a vibrant community. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you. So, for Thank next, you. so the next meeting, yeah, go ahead. You know, should keep some to thank for, Prasad also for something which has echoes of this meeting is thank you for the recommendation of the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Oh, I really enjoyed it. Recommended it recommend to everyone book. in the group. Yeah. And I can share the book also. Somebody sent me an EPUB. I'll share the book with you. Yeah, please do. Yeah. So I think for next time, we already have uh, five people. Uh, Mr. Muthuraman, Mr. Lakshmi Narayan, then uh, we have Suresh and uh, Ravi also said he'll, uh, he wants to... Ravi, Ravi was asking you time for a walk-in. Uh, for a walk-in? It's not what? so structured. I love, yeah, I love a walk-in. That's Ravi now. You know, to, because when you're talking of multilingual... He I needs a whole hour, I think. My... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a couple of minutes, a couple of minutes. People who have grown up in a, in a military environment as children, we had something, uh, we had two institutions which we grew up with. One was Sarva Dharma Saman. So you had one place where Hindus, Muslims, Sikh, Isai, Christians, everyone would go at their respective times and pray and come, right? The other thing uh, that they would propagate, the parents would propagate is Sarva Bhasha Saman. So it didn't matter that I was a Tamilian. Fact is, I think in Hindi, to Prasad's point. My silent language, even now when I'm talking, the silent, faster language is Hindi. It's translating quickly into English and then coming out. So uh, on that note, if you'll give me one minute, I have eight lines to share with you. OK? OK. It's something called uh, Pushpaki Abhilasha. Ah. Uh. 
it's somebody called Makhanlal Chaturvedi who had written this. A lot of people yes. take credit for this, but this was Makhanlal Chaturvedi. It goes as follows. Chah nahi main surbala ke gehnom mein gunja jau. This is a flower. What is it dream of? What is it? What is its in core desire? Chah nahi main surbala ke gehnom mein gunja jau. Chah nahi premi mala mein बिन प्यारी को ललचाऊं, चाह नहीं सम्राटों के शव पर हे हरि डाला जाऊं, सम्राट जा रहे हैं पुष्प को तोड़ के हे हरि हरि बोल के पुष्प को तो फेंकते हैं, चाह नहीं देवों के सिर पर चढ़ूं, भाग पर इटलाऊं, मुझे तोड़ लेना वनमाली उस पथ पर देना तुम फेक मातृभूमि पर शीश चढ़ाने जिस पर जाए वीर अनेक मातृभूमि पर शीश चढ़ाने जिस पर जाए वीर अनेक वहां पर मुझे फेंक के दो वही मेरी अभिलाषा है इट इट सॉर्ट ऑफ आई गेट गुड पिंपल्स इवन थिंकिंग ऑफ दिस एवरी टाइम आई थिंक एंड आई सी अ uh, a jawan passing by or an army officer passing by i just a military officer passing by i can't just but stop admire and say a silent salute guys i can't do what you've done although my father did it for 40 years i guess so ravi this this was taught in school uh, yes. for me i i studied in kendra vidyalaya and uh, the person who was my hindi teacher his father was a martyr and when he taught this he cried in front of the class yeah mm -hmm. yeah we came very close to it so i understand what he must have gone through so yeah i still i still remember him sunil yeah his his name was ramji paswan mm -hmm. ramji paswan so Thanks for letting okay. me walk in, Shibu. I, I didn't Thank need to spend some time. But I think uh, next time we'll not allow any more walk-ins, <laughs> especially not from Ravi, because rules are rules are rules. It's eight ten, and people have lives. <laughs> Emma, we need you. We started at eight eleven, so seven eleven, so eleven minutes allowed. Idhar. No. Idhar chato ke idhar longa mein. No. Rules are rules are rules. He is. Chalo. He is thinking okay. in Hindi now. <laughs> Okay guys okay, bye -bye. good night bye, -bye. bye, -bye. thank you thank you. thanks for all thanks the contributions thanks everybody thank you very much lovely enjoyed you. it bye